Hello, my name is Ken, and I want to welcome you back to Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strengths Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the effect of working out the will and calling of God in our lives. The title of this message is, Don't Play With Your Salvation. Let's go to scripture to get this message started. As you may know by now, I love to include scripture in these discussions, so that you know I'm not just making things up, although I do leave some scripture out so that you can experience a journey of discovery as you read your Bible. I find that it is always exciting when God shows me a scripture that relates to a past message and connects it in my mind, bringing them together in order to deepen my understanding of him. So let's pack them and stack them. Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is a gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Not to use a gory illustration, but it is a first thought that popped into my mind when I read this scripture this time. I see a theater full of people, and as they are watching and enjoying the movie, with not a care in the world, the lights begin to flicker and then swing back and forth. Then suddenly the building begins to surge back and forth so that all the people react to their immediate thought, which is that if they don't get out of the building, it might come right down on them. Now they don't think because they are in a panic. But the buildings are coming apart outside, but the buildings are coming apart outside and littering the sidewalks and streets with death crushing debris. So in one fell swoop, they descend on the exit door, but the overwhelming mad rush to get out, the frontline peeps are pushed to the floor and the bodies begin to stack up, blocking anyone from exiting the building. Will the end be like this? Yes, well, no. It will be hundreds of times worse because whether you get out of the building or get trapped in it, you are in danger of forever being separated from God, because for your indecisive decision to wait or not to accept him at all, the danger for you exists both outside as well as inside. There is no escape. Revelation 6, 14, 17. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountain and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Matthew 21, 24. But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Some will wait until it's too late, because even though Jesus left us the greatest resource to have ever and will have ever existed, which is the Bible, some will still question his authority over everything, both living and dead. We think Jesus owes us a response to his existence All the while we face hell without him. Can we say S-T-U-P-I-D? Yes, I was, but I am no more. Matthew 25, 1 through 12. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now I have heard some attribute this story to both the unsaved and the saved. But I see something else, and it is okay to see something else. Whereby this story is about ten people who say they know Jesus and have lived a well-meaning Christian life. They all believed they were in. So if five were unbelievers, they wouldn't be trying to get to the Jesus spaceship. Ignorance is not a life jacket, a parachute a ramp to destiny. Nope, you had better get it together with other authentically born-again believers and get with the program. Listen to the totality of my messages and you will, in fact, be in the high five and not the blind five. Now look, I know it can sound like an arrogant thing to say, but believe you me, I have done the work required to launch this ministry. I have no conflict of interest because the ministry, for now, is online. Membership is optional, 
whether you pay your tithes or not. I really don't care if just one person listens to these things. Lord, let it be a one who sets the world aflame with the good news. And you are not required to believe everything I say. No more than you are required to believe everything the media states or social media puts out there, or the fact checkers. Well, hopefully I'm not considered in membership to any of these messes. But you get to choose. Listen for God and be changed. In verse 6 it goes on to say, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, least there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Matthew 24, 40, 41. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. So listen, let's go back to verse 6 for a minute. There's a couple of things that kind of stood out to me as I was reading it this time. So look, statistically, half of these people were fools. You can't get one person out of a million to admit that they are a fool. So in the end, there's going to be a lot of people who think that they can go into that spaceship and end up at a wedding. There's just 10 people here, and half of them are fools. Now, I know some of you could say, well, how come the other five didn't share what they had? Wouldn't Jesus do that? Nope. And you see in this case that Jesus didn't even know them. He says, I do not know you. That's wisdom. How many of us give our resources to people we don't even know, thinking that we are doing the work of the Lord? Cut. There's one thing that a wise person does, and that is that they take care of themselves first. Then they can take care of others. If you don't take care of yourself first, you'll be no good for others. Another point here it says, and buy for yourselves. It's going to cost you something to know Jesus. It's not a free ride. There's going to be things you're going to need to sacrifice in order to get to know him. But it is worth it. I think ultimately when you can get to a place where you say, I would give it all to know him more. Paul said it. I think that's where you want to get. And the other thing is that they thought they had plenty of time. Like there were no worries. So in the time they should have been preparing, they were sleeping and resting. Maybe going on vacation. Hitting a cruise ship. Who knows what we do at that time where we should be preparing. Remember, he said he's going to come as a thief in the night. Some of us will know, but most of us won't. Are you ready? This is no joke. I mean, really, are you ready? Are you ready for him to come back? Keep in mind, those other five virgins thought that they were in. All right, enough of that. Let's go on. So this event is not the beginning of a labor shortage. Nope. This is the beginning of some serious times ahead. This event is known as the rapture. Surely you have seen the movie, LOL. But seriously, if people are really removed instantaneously from whatever they are doing when he decides to beam them up, and there's not a supernatural intervention of the ensuing chaos that will occur, such as planes falling from the sky, you too will cry out for the rocks to fall on you. The movies fall way short of portraying the events after the rapture. The world is not prepared to be called into the courts of God. This will be a mess, and many a heart attack will faint at the sight of such a mess. you got to take God seriously. He is coming back. Matthew 25, 32, 34. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. So however you get to heaven, be it as a permanent resident or guest, you will be shepherded into one of two groups. There will not be a call out for each denomination to form their own circle of believers, separate from the other denominations. 
there will not be an announcement for the non-denominations. You know the ones who believe they rescued the church from total collapse? To gather in their circles, separate from the denominations and other denominational churches. Nope, there will not be a Jehovah's Witness section, separate from the Mormon section, separate from the Catholic section. Nope, just two groups. His, in lowercase his, God's kids, or Satan and his kids. I know, but this is explained in another message insofar as who's your daddy. Just know there will only be two groups, the made-its and the almost made-its, and everything in between will find their spot on one side or the other. Luke 13, 23, 24. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. What? Is this talking about the made and the almost made it? Well, yes, it is, Ken. Religion and cult churches will be two hindrances to the body of almost believers. You see, just because you say you believe doesn't mean you are in. James 2:19. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. What? I thought the Bible stated that to be saved, I just had to believe. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In your heart, in your heart, in your heart. Sounds like a lyric to a great worship song. So it is not enough to believe, and I can say this without invalidating the scripture. Context aroni is imperative when reading the word. 1 Peter 4, 16, 19. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Context Aroni. Who makes up such words? Okay, so we hard shifted, or from a non-shifting crowd, we forgot to use the clutch. So we depart from the non-believer for a minute, otherwise we may lose them if they are not 100% in. Suffer. What a gift. A very necessary gift that we need as Christians. Suffering is not your enemy, but your well-suited friend, and if you let it have its way, it will shape you into a fine, good-looking Christian who can soldier through anything. Verse 17. For the time has come for judgment, to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So you know that I like the scripture chopping study method. Sometimes because it chops up the scripture into smaller bite-sized pieces. I believe that the house of God is in judgment now. Not saying it hasn't been before, but in my generation I see it. With so much of the absence of God, that is the Holy Spirit, from the churches of today, is it any wonder why we don't equip the saints for the work of ministry? Is it any wonder why the world lacks strong Christian leadership? Where are the disciples that remain? Where on God's green earth is a plethora of signs and wonders the world so badly needs. How did we end up thinking mediocrity was a high watermark? Since when did size become the goal over quality and character? Listen, I say listen to my message on church purpose to go deeper on this subject. But suffice to say, because we are not obeying God, he has entered into the bedroom, sat down next to us, and is explaining why we are about to get spanked. I think it works like this. Obey, obey, and his discipline goes away. Verse 18. Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Oh, so I am saved, Ken, and I'm going to stop listening as you are being unnecessarily hard on the believer and the church. So is Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosiah. Oh, well, you get my point. According to Revelations 19.7, the bride makes herself ready. And if you consider yourself a part of the bride, then we have to make ourselves ready together. Together. This is Peter saying that we, who are scarcely saved, I would not hang on to anything that will dim the light on this verse. I think Peter wanted to ensure that we would not also say that I would never leave you, Jesus. Even if the others do so, I will not. Matthew 26, 
33, 35. So verse 19 states, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Did you know that a part of the will of God is that you suffer? What? I said, did you know that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that is Jesus, his only begotten, to place his own son on the cross? Isaiah 53.10 So what say you in his majesty? We think we know stuff, but in truth we know so little of ourselves to think or believe that suffering is something altogether to be avoided in the human life. In Hebrews 2.10 it states in part that he was perfected. Yes, perfection was perfected in suffering. How much more are we to on the perfection journey? It is not so weird when you think about it in this more human way. Navy SEALs are perfected through much suffering. Athletics are perfected through much suffering. Musicians, see it? Do you see it now? So don't let suffering throw you off guard the next time it visits your doorsteps. Invite it in. I heard or read someone say that we are all just one heartbeat away from eternity. This is a sobering thought if you end up on the wrong side of it. You really don't have any idea as to how long you will be on this planet. You could be at the top of your game doing everything humanly possible to maintain a superior, super, healthy, healthy lifestyle. And out of nowhere, plop, plop, you are now his. You now see the truth, period. If you are a believer, then I suggest, if you are not already doing so, for you to get on the ball with your ministry, calling, and purpose. Listen, we are not talking about earning your salvation. We are talking about your response to your salvation, which should be to engage in the battle for Middle Earth. It's the smallest part of the earth, like the body of authentically born-again believers. Matthew 7, 13, 14. Luke 13, 23, 24. But back to the plea to non- or unbelievers. If you know you are one of those, and you know you have been waiting to receive Christ until you get as close to a deathbed experience as possible so that you can live life on your terms for as long as possible, then you may want to consider that you may not get a chance for a deathbed conversion. You may die listening to this message, eating breakfast, at work, on a jog, at the gym, or in your sleep. What a price to pay, and to pay it for ages and ages, for all of eternity. No hope of a Redeemer ever again. No more Jesus coming down the road. When he says it is finished, it will be finished. Listen, I'm not trying to spook you into believing. If that is your motivation to try and enter into the born-again experience, then no, don't do it. You must see that you are so missing the mark according to God's standards that you loathe yourself. You must come to hate your constant sinning against God, while at the same time hurting others or yourself. You must know the price Jesus paid. The eternally high price was not paid for so that you would stop sinning. Jesus' cross experience, in part, removed the obstacle of sin so that we could get to know God without the hindrance of sin. If you sin after you are born again, then it does nothing more than add greater value to the cross event. It's the gift that keeps on giving, but by all means move away from the things that create an appetite for your sins and walk in freedom because it is another benefit of the cross event. Galatians 5, 1. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, it states, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them a strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hmm, so what of this? Did you not want the truth in your life? In the movie A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson hit the nail fright on the head when he responded to Tom Cruise's statement, I want the truth. To which Jack Nicholson responded, You can't handle the truth. 
Is that not this scripture? Zoom up with the green screen. We live and breathe the scriptures in all that we say and do, and yet we miss the point of it. So in this scripture, God responds to their rejection of the truth and allows or empowers them to believe the lie. Do you believe anything CNN sputters out? CNBC? CBS? Politicians? Heck, it could be your pastor if he's a plant sent by Satan. We know in today's church they will invite him in if he jingles his pockets. Look, I'm not saying that all churches are trying to get rich. Some are just trying to pay their bills, which is almost as bad as trying to get rich. I just don't see the example of a ministry worrying about such things anywhere in the Bible. Paul did make some mention about resources, but only that one church helped him in his ministry at a point in time when he needed resources. Philippians 4, 15, 18. So many churches with address, so few able or willing to do the work of ministry or to help others do the same. Poof, case or cover closed. So if you reject God, you will be deceived and believe the lie. We see it all of the time in world events. It was most obvious to me in 2020. I could not believe how many took the bait, hook, line, and sinker on so many issues that were not shared in truth at all or in partial truths. No discernment, no wisdom, no testing of any spirit. 1 John 4, 1, 3 Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Enough said. Think about that. That was said 2,000 years ago. You still think he's here? Just in case you didn't know, demons don't die. Romans 1, 18, 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served a creature rather than the Creator, who blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only to do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So in this passage, we see that God enables those who reject the truth to believe lies and to do things that are known to be unnatural with their bodies. 
This is happening at an alarming rate these days. Not only are we, as Christians, not aware that this stuff is of God, but that it is creating a separation between those who know and want to know God, and those who don't want to know Him or desire His truth. What this doesn't mean is that if you struggle with these things, that you are not His. Korah's rebellion kills a lot of ignorant people. Number 16. King David took a census in 2 Samuel 24, and though he was moved to do so, so that God could judge Israel, God did in fact judge Israel. I call it collateral damage. And yes, God will still and has the ability to judge all men fairly. Continue to fight the battle against such sinful deeds, and one day you will prevail. I think this message should speak to the person who is being saved more than to those who are already born again. And the reason is that time is short and the cost of a wrong decision or procrastination is beyond comprehension for the one who ends up in hell. It should be noted that for the one who is already born again, that what few things that are laid out in this message is a reason why we walk in a peaceful urgency as we work to fulfill our ministry. I have already unfolded the Works for Salvation message if you want to get a better understanding as to why we should avoid at all costs being an armchair Christian. Well, that's it for today. I hope you get what you needed to got from this message. And if you got more than you wanted, then give some of it away. Remember, it's not what you find wrong or disagree with regarding these messages, but what you can take away from it. Together we can do more to impact the kingdom than if we work alone. Let's flip the script and kill, steal, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of lights to shine through into people's lives. Find a seat and click on the like and subscribe button. Let's build this ministry together. Thanks and see you next time in deep waters.